Hello you, it's uh, Circadian here again, and having taken care of my important business, I'm going to re-embark on this frankly foolish attempt to explain everything about CK2, and also try and hold your attention while doing it, which I now see could be quite tricky, because god there's a lot to get through. Um, I just want to clarify what we were talking about in part one, so uh, here, I... <laughs> Because I was a little bit distracted because I had something I needed to take care of, I found myself re repeatedly just using the wrong words at the wrong times, which must have been fairly confusing. Um, let's just quickly run through this again, first of all. So let's start with Thurmond down here on the county page for Thurmond. You can see um, with the Dijour button clicked. And if, if it is Dijour A, I don't know, I think it's Dijour, but it's a 50 50. Um, with the Dijour button clicked, you can see the, the hierarchy of the duchy level, the kingdom level, and finally the empire level. Uh, so it's the empire of Britannia, the kingdom of Ireland, and it's the duchy of Mumu. You click through to Mumu, you can see these three things. That's uh, Desmond, Thormund, uh, excuse me, Thormund, Ormond, and Desmond. And if we go, actually just before I move on, let's just show you what the claimants look like, because there is a claimant to my petty kingdom. There are three, in fact. One of them is my half-brother, Conqueror my aunt and my half-brother. These guys all have claims which will show up here so if you go and click onto his character page you can see the claim for uh, the kingdom of Mumu and that will be inherited by his children. You can have strong claims and weak claims. Weak claims are not inherited unless you press them in war. Don't worry too much about that. But as far as inheritance is concerned if you have one uh, your top level holding so you could be say that you could have the kingdom of Ireland and also you would almost certainly have to have two duchies uh, if you died and you had two children what would happen would be that you would pass the kingdom on to your direct heir your eldest son I mean depending on the exact succession type but let's say you have you have primogeniture, so um, sorry, you have kid. So that would go to your eldest son. He would also get one of your duchies, and I'm not entirely sure how it determines which one it is. It's usually where your capital would be, uh, but the other duchy would pass to your second son. He would then become the Duke of X, the Duke of Connaught, let's say, and then he would become the vassal of your son, and also awkwardly would have a claim on the kingdom, and it would get ugly, and it always gets ugly. Um, that's effectively how it works and so just to give you an idea about how this can go wrong and the ways in which i have failed in crusader kings 2 by making massive errors i conquered all of britannia had the empire of britannia so when my character dies the emperor uh, passes the the empire on to his eldest son and sure all of the lower level titles get mixed up and jumbled around with various you know in-laws and nephews and what have you but the, the empire is solid but what I then did was I conquered loads more of, uh, well, particularly this area here. And I did something very stupid when I did that, because I then created the Empire of Scandinavia. If you just click through, you can see uh, the county of Vestfold, part of the Duchy of Ostlandet, which is part of the Kingdom of Norway, the Empire of Scandinavia. And when I created the Empire of Scandinavia, I created a problem for myself, because then I have two empires, and the succession doesn't work like that. So suddenly that emperor that empire goes to my my second son, and then I have two children with two different empires, and they hate each other, and oh, it's a big old mess. You want to keep, if you can, and it's not always possible or easy to do this, you want to keep one top-level uh, kind of um, title. That's the word I'm looking for. I, am, I, I noticed watching the last video back, I'm having some jargon issues, and I am just going to check to make sure it's running okay. Looks like it is. Uh, so, at the moment, we hold the petty kingdom of Mumu, and as the, the petty king or the duke of Mumu, we could theoretically take all of this land here, as long as we don't form any additional duchies because these are all individual counties at the moment. We hold the only duchy title on the entirety of the land mass of Ireland. So we, if we can't, if we, if we uh, presuming no one else makes a duchy in the meantime, which may well happen, but if we were to conquer all of that and we had whatever it is, uh, nine, 10, 11 counties and one duchy title, we could hold that together just about. 
although there would be problems. Um, but in terms of the succession, the duchy would continue, and all of the counties would continue to be vassals of the duchy. You probably want to make the kingdom just to make life a lot easier. Uh, but uh, the whole point about going off on that rant in the first place was to explain the different types of inheritance, which we will now attempt to do on the laws page. So that's a classic kingmatic example thing, and it's actually worth having a read of this. The titles of the ruler are divided among his children, with the oldest getting the primary title. And if the ruler has no children who can inherit, the law defaults to primogeniture. Huh? Okay. Uh, you get no prestige penalty for having unlanded sons and can have a 30% larger domain. Gavelkind is a very popular law with everyone except the oldest child. Destruction of titles while under Gavelkind and succession is not allowed. Women can inherit, but only if there are no eligible males, um, which is what the agnatic cognatic means. So um, absolute cognatic means women can inherit on the same grounds. Agnatic means only men can uh, inherit. Agnatic and cognatic quite know how they correspond to the genders, but they do. And then you can change your succession laws. So, and there are agnatic and absolute cognatic, agnatic, agnatic variations on most of these things. The one that you're probably going to want is primogeniture, because it's nice and simple. The oldest child inherits everything. And if, when you switch to that, you're going to upset some people quite a lot, especially if you have a lot of children. <laughs> Excuse me. The, uh, the alternative is ultimogeniture, which is just the youngest child, which is also uh, controversial. It has a lot of drawbacks to it as well from a kind of gameplay perspective, because you always end up with... I mean, you don't really want children in a regency inheriting if you can avoid it because they have an unfortunate tendency to get murdered. The others, we won't get into tanistry. Um, elective monarchy is... Uh, yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I haven't played with elective monarchy or elective gavelkin much because they scare me. Um, I always will just go... You almost always start with cognatic gavelkin. Well, uh, that's not true, but uh, you often do. And primogeniture is just... From an administrative perspective, it's the easiest one to deal with. The only problem there is it's really quite difficult to get to primogeniture. You have to, if we look at the conditions, you, um, oh well, we actually have all of them in place. That's surprising. The lone vassal has a negative, I only have one vassal, fair enough. Uh, oh, I, I'd expected that to be much more complicated. I'm slightly confused. Oh, well, we'll get there as soon as I can. Um, so, yeah, there you go. That's a brief rundown of how that works. We'll have a look at the other two tabs now, so the realm laws and the obligation laws. The realm laws are very basic at the moment because we are on uh, ducal only, and centralization is currently set to min. You increase it, and it will increase your available domain size at vassal limit. Not sure what the drawbacks are there. As time passes and your land and technology becomes more complex, you'll find more laws available here to do with all kinds of complicated matters. Um, it's particularly when you... Uh, the realm laws become more complicated when you become a kingdom. Uh, obligations are your vassal's obligations. And these are there are more of these. It's worth pointing out this has a scroll bar. It's easy to miss and forget, but there's a load more. Um, so your feudal levies dictate how much, uh, how many troops your, your vassals have to give you. And you'll see this is locked, and it's because the technology is not sufficient to develop max uh, feudal levies. That's the same for most of these. And once we get to the technology tree, we'll see a little bit more about that. But yeah, basically, you can increase these. There's a limit on how often you can do it. I think once you change a law, you get like you can only change a law every five or ten years. I forget what the exact limit is, but it's it's there and it's annoying. And these are quite basic at the moment, as I say, because we're only uh, duke level. If you get to kingdom level or empire level, they become much more involved, and there's a lot more kind of administrative our sake involved as well. Right. So let's do the technology page. Here we see the technology. There are three sets of tech, uh, military, economic, and culture. And we, at 1066, we just have a kind of base two tech, two pips in each tech down the way. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these at this stage. Um, they are of varying importance. 
Right, so the military ones, you've got a big chunk here. These all uh, light, heavy, and cavalry will determine basic effectiveness of your troops in battle, and that's pretty much it. Siege equipment is for your um, the speed at which you're able to conduct sieges of enemy holdings, and is extremely useful. Shipbuilding is uh, just determines the upper limit on your ship, uh, your fleet size. Military organization is a really big deal. Morale of armies is extremely important, and global supply limit. Uh, also very important, and for some reason I thought that I managed something else as well. Ha! Huh. I'm pretty sure military organization... Maybe that's a DLC thing, I thought it ga governed uh, revenue size. Well, apparently not. Um, so, economy advances. These are crucial for improving your ability to develop the buildings in your holding and in particular uh, castle towns and castle walls so I think it's uh, yeah castle infrastructure 4 unlocks castle town 4 and some other less important stuff as well that's always a big target town infrastructure I think gives you the walls no no, no, no improve makes moves improved keeps gives you the walls you also have church infrastructure and uh, town infrastructure Trade practices and construction aren't really that important construction build time trade practices just dictate stuff that I've never really cared about. Uh, yeah, and I didn't claim to be an expert on all of this stuff. And then cultural advances. These are generally modifiers which just give little modifiers to personal opinion. So uh, noble customs is almost all about feudal vassal opinions. The same for city vassals and it's kind of annoying that they're split. So your bishops uh, run off of the religious customs tech, your uh, mayors run off of the popular customs, your vassals all run off of noble customs. So this is more important than these two. Majesty uh, is I mean, it's just uh, the short reign is you get it if you just take over you have a short reign penalty um, of opinion with people and that can be reduced and you also increase your monthly gain in piety and prestige tolerance uh, is for religious tolerance and legalism is um, mostly to do with available laws so as you move up the legalism tree you unlock more laws as you move on and I quickly talk about the ways in which you you increase your tech you can see here I've got 0 0.052 points and that's a monthly modifier I think I think it's an annual one I'm pretty sure it's monthly and as you can see that is kind of dictated by two of my stats learning and stewardship for economy uh, for military it'll be learning and military learning and martial and for culture it'll be learning and diplomacy and then there's a couple of modifiers you can chuck in elsewhere at the moment I have zero 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 points as time passes these will accumulate and I will accumulate points here also uh, through other means particularly my spy master who's studying tech if he triggers the tech bonus then I'll get 50 points for one of these three things and then you spend them and when you accumulate enough points you can spend them in one of these so you can see if I wanted to invest in my infantry I'd need 300 points you get a penalty or a bonus depending on how far ahead or behind you are against I think it's regional neighbours might be just against par across the world I think it's against people in your general vicinity so even if you don't really invest anything in it you'll get massive bonuses to your uh, costs which will enable you to play catch up there's kind of a blue shell mechanic going on you you want to try and keep up with the Joneses but it's not that big a deal Onto the military tab. Uh, so this is pretty straightforward. If I want to raise my troops, I can click here, and there you'll see I have 600 troops stationed in the therm. These are all my guys. You can then unraise them like so. I can also raise 26 from my vassals. Don't have any tribal vassals. If I had tribal vassals, I could call them to all of this. Uh, however, this will raise my my vassals uh, levy and I get 26 guys from the Viking dude and I get one guy here from I'm guessing the oh well I can see no, he yeah from the city of Limerick so my mayor has provided one one dude and if you hover over here you can kind of see the maps which determine uh, determine how many troops you get from them and this can be heavily increased with your opinion. So, because I have plus one opinion with Dinatak, the mayor of Limerick, I get one troop. If I had a hundred, 
I'd get 100% of the total available, which I think would be 142. That's how it works. With the bishops, it's a bit weirder because the bishops are... They determine who to give their troops to based on whether they like you more than the Pope or not. If they like the Pope more than you, they'll give their troops to the Pope. So this is why you want, well, why I've sent my uh, chaplain to improve religious relations so that I can hopefully get this dude on side and he will then start giving me troops instead of giving them to Rome. But that could be some ways off. Mostly you don't want to be relying too much on your vassals. You want to be relying on your own domain limit, uh, your own domain levy. And there's also here a tab for the fleets. I currently have one boat available to me. And then there's a tab for retinues, which I can't even click on right now. Um, why am I, why is retinues greyed out? It shouldn't be greyed out. As it says, it depends on your military organisation tech and the size of all the levies in the rain. Oh, it's because I'm not a, I, I'm too insignificant. You can't get um, retinues until you're a king. Apparently, I think that's new. But uh, you need a fairly substantial kingdom in order to be able to justify retinues. But retinues essentially are always raised troops who you kind of pay for using a different thing. We won't have to worry about it. They're pretty useful. Um, they're particularly useful if you're Vikings, but I'm not going to get into it right now. That's, uh, that's the basics of that tab. Go to Intrigue. So on the Intrigue page you have a lot of available decisions. Um, there's kind of two halves to this. So decisions contains a lot of stuff. Well, a lot of it wasn't really to do with spying. A lot of it's just kind of day-to-day -day stuff that you can trigger uh, at any time or at certain times, which gives you a bonus or you costs you money. And we'll just go through what's available to me at the moment. So promote commander, I can pay 25 prestige and four and a half gold. And a soldier turns up, and you know it's kind of a random dice roll as to what kind of stats he'll have. He'll probably be all right at fighting can be useful. Similar do, deal for invite noble, invite holy bo um, invite noble, invite holy man and present debutante. Uh, debutantes uh, bring you eligible women, which is nice. Nobles will bring you just a, a steward, my bad, uh, and holy men chaplains. You don't seem to have one for getting chancellors, which is a shame, but th you'd ne you would never go down that route. There's a much more effective way I'll talk about later of getting hold of good people. I guess there are times when you might have to go down that route, but there's a much, generally much more effective way. Sometimes it's not available to you. Uh, but we'll come to that later, he said, for the 45th time. You can hold a feast, costs 25 bucks, and gives you a plus 5, or plus 0.05 monthly bonus to your prestige for a fixed period of time. It's not permanent. And I think it's only for a year, actually. And it's, uh, it's not very good, but the, you get other events during the feast. And we'll see some events when we eventually start time rolling. Um, the same is true of the summer fair. Again, uh, costs money. You get a prestige. Uh, you, I think you have to have both the cash, and it's also got to be the summer. And in fact, if I mouse over the... Yeah, so the month is greater or equal to May and is less than August. We're currently in September, so we'll have to wait until next year. Go on a ground hunt. Again prestige for money, but also events which can, uh, I think more so than the Feast or the Summer Fair, the Grand Hunt can get you events which can make um, quite a big difference. You can kind of, depending on how the dice fall, you can get some pretty nice traits that will add to your <coughs> overall statistics and character. And then finally, by indulgence for your sins, which basically, if you've really pissed the Pope off, you can do things here. But a lot of, a lot of things will appear in the decisions menu, which they just kind of don't live anywhere else. And so it's a bit misleading having them under Intrigue. Uh, decisions is sort of adjacent to Intrigue, but it also contains a lot of other stuff. But the Intrigue menu also contains the proper Intrigue stuff, which is down below. So um, click to choose a plot is a button that I can click here, and this will allow me to plot to kill any number of people. Let's, for instance, plot to kill my half-brother Conqueror. So that didn't work. Is that greyed out? Am I actually not able to do that? Or have I just, no, I just clicked on the wrong thing. Okay, so, as I mentioned earlier, plot power is the metric which determines this. I have now selected and initiated the kill Doncha, uh, Conqueror MacDonchad plot. I have a plot power of 44.1%. For a plot to trigger, for it to actually happen, 
or to have a chance at happening. You need to have a plot power of 100%. So, as I mentioned earlier with the Spy Master, adding that you can have him increase plot power in a region, which uh, for this Spy Master would add 6.9%, which would make it, you know, it wouldn't make a difference between it happening or not. Um, the odds of it happening once you get over 100% are improved by how far over 100% you are, so you can get up to like three, four hundred percent and once you start doing that then it starts becoming very likely that that will happen very soon. When you're at 100% it might happen and I think it's a yearly chance that they, they roll the die, uh, so you know you want to push it as much as possible. But as you can see the empty backers screen here, or area, if I click on this, invite potentially useful characters to your plot and so Here's the potential plotter screen. What you really want to take notice of here are these two things. So the plot power, which is how much plot power this person will bring to your plot if you persuade them to join you, and then the uh, the thumbs up or thumbs down. And as you can see, no one's really into it. And then you can see the reasons why. So um, Toddleback, the Chancellor, he's immoral, uh, but he has a base reluctance. And also, he quite likes Conquer so he's kind of unkeen for that reason as well. He likes Conquer more than he likes me, in fact. And I suspect nobody will be into this. I don't really want to kill him anyway. I just want to show you. But um, yeah, there's th so there are three uh, different states. You can have the red thumbs down, the green thumbs up. In which case, once you invite them, they'll say yes. But there's also the hand in the middle, which effectively means give me some money. So if I wanted to bribe Bebin here. If I right click on Bebin's portrait, I get a load of kind of options for the character. And one of them is send gift. So I can send Bebin 15 bucks, and that will increase her opinion by me of 18. And if she was kind of wavering and you send her money, it will often be enough to push them over the top. So a lot of the time, getting people assassinated is just simply about chucking gold at people. Funny, that, you know pretty much how it used to actually work. Now I don't really want to kill uh, Conquer uh, Conquerbar, so we're going to end that, but before I do you can also auto invite plotters, so this button will just take care of all of the admin for you. There is obviously a downside in that if he finds out that you're trying to kill him then that's going to be a problem and the more that you kind of invite people the more likely he is to find out, so yeah, there's, a, there's risks definitely. Factions, uh, there aren't any factions in my kingdom but Effectively, once you get to a certain size, uh, particularly when you hit kingdom level, you're going to find that your vassals start. Um, as well as kind of plotting against you individually, they have uh, faction plots where they will start organizing factions to demand sometimes basic stuff like just revoking laws, um, making the laws less uh, arduous for them so that they might want to reduce their levy contributions, but also stuff like um, factions to impose a certain air on the kingdom or just straight up independence and when they get enough um, when they get enough troop power in their factions when they have enough men to actually beat you in a fight they will just send you an ultimatum saying give us this thing or we'll fight you and then you have to kill them uh, that's as simple as that religion the religion tab is I just don't really want to get into Catholicism right now all right so here's our Pope and the first thing to note on this screen is that all religions have a thing called moral authority, uh, which is um, the religion itself that holds the moral authority, not the Pope. And if we hover over this, 74.9 is a percentage, and you can see well, the many things that determine it. So each religion has five holy sites, and if you control those holy sites, that uh, brings you 10% for a maximum of 50 um, if your religion is organized, uh, you get an extra 20%, and then, you know, there's other, so the diplomacy and the piety of the Pope has an impact. And the higher the moral authority of the religion, the easier it is to do things like uh, convert counties, that's, that's the main one, I think. A couple of other things as well. It, it applies in various areas to do with religious life. You can get into messing with the religion, so... Here's a list of my bishops, and oh, actually, do you know, without the um, the DLC, this is a lot more basic. There is a DLC which really expands this whole side of the game, and uh, I mean, I guess if you're into that, then it's worthwhile. But I've never really felt any great benefit from it myself. Um, but yeah, you can 
uh, with the Catholic with the Catholics, <laughs> you can make them. You can kind of you know uh, play this little mini game of uh, spending money on getting your bishops into the Council of Rome, and then they all become you know you get to control the Pope, and I don't really know what the benefit of that is to be honest and stuff. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, this I don't know what that does. So that's the religion tab, pretty dull. And then finally, the societies tab. Now there are no known societies which you can join. I wonder if that will change, or if that's another DLC thing. I'm not sure why it's on here. If it's purely DLC, there was a uh, societies were introduced in one of the later DLCs, and they're pretty cool. Uh, you can for a basic on a, with all of my DLC enabled, there will be four different societies on this screen. Three of them are kind of Catholic monk orders, so it's the Benedictines and of other lads, the Dominicans, I think, and you can kind of work your way up and level up as a Benedictine, and then when you get to the top, you can do all kinds of really funky spiritual stuff and teach virtues to people. And then the fourth society is the Satanists, and that gets pretty pretty dark pretty quickly. Um, you can get really, I, I don't want to spoil any of it, but yeah, there's some, there's some pretty hair-raising stuff that happens when you start going down the Satanist route. And with different cultures you get things, so as a Shia Muslim you can play as uh, the Assassin Society, which is you know, the hash and murdering. Uh, there's different variations on Satanism, so the, Norwe uh, the Vikings have the, um, the Society of Hell. Um, yeah, it's just there's a whole lot of fun to be had, but for some reason the tabs here, um, there's not a lot going on with it. So that concludes that part of the interface. All right, well done. Thanks for coming this far with me. I really appreciate it. We should now talk about these things here. This area here on the screen is where you kind of get notifications about pressing things that you need to take care of. And I have five of them at the moment. Various ones will pop up. But believe it or not, we're actually going to start the game very soon. Uh, once I've dealt with this, and actually I say very soon, there's going to be some chat before we get there. But I'm unmarried, and it says we should get married. I'm inclined to agree, largely because, as discussed earlier, I have a solitary top-level title. If I held two duchies, I wouldn't want any more children. I'd be happy with just one child. Because uh, if you get a second child, you're going to split the inheritance. Well, second son, specifically. You will split the inheritance, and that's just going to be a real pain in the neck, and you're going to have to fight to get it back, and it's really bad. But as I have the one sole petty kingdom title, I can conquer as many counties as I like and add them underneath my petty kingdom and I will not have to worry about losing the petty kingdom title. So anything that we get handed out to second and third children, they'll still be vassals of my subsequent character, if you see what I mean. So having more children isn't going to be a problem and having a wife has lots of benefits, as I say, it increases these for one thing. So let's have a look at the wifey screen. Now, you can get betrothed to kids. So Emma, the Princess of France, for instance, is 11. We can set up a betrothal, so when she becomes 16, we immediately get married. It does get a bit icky. I mean, you know, if the, the, the harsh realities of romance in the uh, kind of dark ages are... We're going to be getting into this stuff, and it's it's not pleasant. I just I want to say up front, I don't condone any of this for modern life, but this is how things used to be, and you're going to be hearing me say some things which are, frankly, quite unpleasant. Uh, I am going to apologise for them in advance. A lot of 16-year-olds available, but what you want in a wife, really, uh, is probably not available at this stage. There's actually quite a lot... There's a huge number in fact, of uh, potential spouses out there. So, this is about traits, and you want to choose the traits of your wife uh, to maximum advantage. Already, this is sounding incredibly kind of sinister and outright. Please forgive me. <laughs> but, so, there are hereditary traits in this game, and there are good hereditary traits and bad hereditary traits. The good hereditary traits, uh, let's let's deal with the really important ones. Um, genius, quick and strong, and to a lesser degree attractive. And these are all hereditary traits, so if you get a, a wife or a husband who has that trait, there's a good chance that they'll pass, not by any means guaranteed unfortunately, but there is a chance that they'll pass them on to your children. 
And if you can get enough of these hereditary traits in your bloodline, you can start seeing a lot of these traits, and they are often really useful. Um, genius in particular, but strong is very, very good, and I don't see... I've gotten quite good at kind of spotting them as we scroll through, and I don't see any here. The search, last time I checked, didn't work very well. What we'll do... Just to demonstrate these, um, I'm going to introduce you to the Find Character screen, which you access by pressing the full stop, or if you're American, period button. And that brings up a lot of murmuring. And this lets you search characters anywhere. So let's go to search all. And then, is, is this actually going to work? Yeah. So here we have uh, all of the geniuses that we are able to access. And here is the genius trait uh, thing. One thing I noticed, by the way, when I, and this is a complete tangent, one thing I did notice whilst watching the last video back was that it's really, like, weirdly choppy looking, and I just want to apologise for the, the ropey frame rate. I don't know why it looks so bad. It's quite confusing, but it does. Uh, but, yeah, you hopefully you can see what's going on. So here we have all of the geniuses, and as you can see, uh, he's this uh, character, Ubaid, the spy master of Cyrenica, is blessed with a towering intellect, plus five to all stats across the board, also gets plus one personal combat score, and everybody really likes it. If you can get a wife or a husband with that trait, you are away, but there's none of them available. Quick is the same, but it's plus three instead of plus five, and I don't think you get the personal combat skill bonus. That's correct. Or the vassal opinion. Strong. Strong is interesting. Strong gives you various modifiers are outside. Plus two martial, plus one diplomacy, plus ten percent fertility can be a bonus, can sometimes be a drawback. Health plus one, personal combat score plus one, attraction opinion plus ten, everyone loves a strong person, and then vassal and tribal opinion. And it's just super good. Uh, attractive really is just a big everybody just likes you more if you're attractive. You get plus one diplomacy, but it just everybody thinks you're just amazing and likes you a lot. It's uh, it is governed by uh, sexuality, so you do have um, gay people in this game, and eunuchs, come to think of it, and children. <laughs> and none of those will, you know, if, you're, if your sexuality doesn't really kind of match up, or uh, they're eunuchs, you know, the attraction opinion won't play. It only a, a, it'll only be an attraction-based thing, it won't be a generic thing. Let's want to have a look at the oh, out of diplomatic range. They've added an icon for that. That's pretty cool. So um, here you can see the, the hand thing as well. So these guys, he might be tempted to join my court. This guy, uh, you can specify only people who are interested in joining your court. But let's instead look at some of the negative ones. Now, we've already seen one of them, which is Imbecile. So I don't think Imbecile... Is Imbecile hereditary? Yes, it is. And you can tell because it's the heart-shaped icon. So the heart-shaped icons are the ones which are hereditary. So Imbecile um, Slow is kind of like a reduced version of Imbecile. That's just plus minus three. So these are equivalent to Genius and Quick in reverse. Ugly. Sorry, I've turned the lights on my keyboard off by accident. And now I can't use them anymore. Uh, ugly. Again, the Attraction Opinion, same rules. And Weak. And there's a couple of others as well, but I can't think what they are. But those are kind of the, the counterpoints to the four strong ones. Now, you can spend forever in here just talking about the various things, but we'll come, maybe come back to it later. Uh, at the moment, I'm looking for a wife. Now, in the absence of... I'm actually having to think about what I want to achieve here, as well as giving useful information. In the absence of any positive traits, some of the other ones to look out for, uh, the... You can see that the, the, the deadly sins and the pride, the um, virtues, are numbered, one to seven. And number one is the sexy time uh, virtue slash sin. One is chaste, and uh, the opposite, the red one, the inclined one, is lustful. So it, this basically modifies fertility. Chaste is minus 15, you get piety and learning off the back of it. And we would like to. Here's one. Richarda, a Venetian courtier. The first deadly skin inflames this character. These carnal desires are not appreciated by the church and might also cause problems out of the marital bed. So, yeah, um, they really do. Lustful characters do like to put us about. Uh, but that's kind of, you know, if you want to make sure that your 
your dynasty grows quickly. Getting a lustful wife is pretty useful. There is also just compensating for your bad stats. So, I mean, I have a pretty because my uh, my counselors. <laughs> something else I noticed in the previous video. I am apparently incapable of distinguishing between the words counselor and chancellor and use them interchangeably. Sorry for that. A little bit uh, confusing. My counselors are pretty good. And so I don't need to worry about this so much. But I might, for instance, want to find somebody with really good stewardship. That's a uh, potential. So if I was to take her, I'd get plus um, Rucker, the courtier of Apulia. I'd get plus seven. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So she would add seven to my stewardship, which would bring it up to state stewardship of 26, which would increase my domain size, I think. Quite sure how the um, I think it's every twenty points, but I, I don't know. But that could be useful because my domain size is actually pretty small, and it would also I think impact on my taxation as well. There is another consideration, however, which is that these are often noble women. Most of them are noble women, and because they're from noble houses, they very often will have both um, the uh, kind of the marriage ties are useful for making alliances with other other nations, other, other counts, other rulers, and they also often come with claims on other counties, and that can mean that your, and in fact their children can often inherit other other counties. So you can just sex your way to owning places. Now it's not a path that I've ever really gone down because I'm I'm more of a military type person, and it just you know I've, I it's quite hard to find these these little sort of bonuses but if you have a look here almost all of these people involve non-aggression packs and non-aggression packs are pretty boring but you can then with the help of a non-aggression pact and good opinion with the person uh, who you know your brother-in-law whoever it may be you can then build an alliance and an alliance has become quite well fairly useful they make you less of a juicy target for attacking so people are very wary of attacking you if you have an alliance and you can quite easily in this game spin up alliances with for instance the Byzantine Empire. And if you have an alliance with the Byzantine Empire, suddenly you're pretty much untouchable. No one's going to be messing with you. There's a hereditary trait. Oh, she's got a hair lip. See? Told you there are other ones. Most of the, there's a lot of negative um, hereditary physical traits, which are pretty unfortunate. Hunchback is another one. Dwarfism. Yeah, you can, you can imagine there's some fairly nasty stuff going on. So, in terms of actually picking out a wife here, Let me just see if I can spot claims. So um, you can sort them. There's various ways to sort. I've been clicking here. Religion is also a bit of a problem. Uh, you kind of want to, if you can, get somebody of the same religion. Although if the wife likes you enough, you can always persuade them to convert if they're of a heathen religion. But let's sort them by rank again. Yeah, the sort often doesn't really work in this game, unfortunately. Or are they just... I swear I saw a princess. Oh, there's one. Okay, so a couple of Hungarian princesses here, and a Norwegian as well. I don't know why these uh, torches are there. And you can see, so the crown shows that they have claims. So if we were to get with Arpad of Hungary, she has a weak claim on the kingdom of Hungary, but the claim can be inherited by a successor. So our child, if we were to have one, would have a claim on the Kingdom of Hungary, which is kind of a big deal. Probably not going to be top of the line of succession, because the um, the Arpads, uh, what are they, the Salamons, yeah, there's going to be a lot of them. So if we click through, it is the Arpad. So House Arpad, it's currently 15 living members, actually. And there's a king with no heirs. Hmm. I'm not going to get into this now, but there is a definite opportunity there to try and sex and assassinate your way to the Kingdom of Hungary. Just saying, it's an option, you can look at it. Uh, I'm not going to do it myself because it's too much bloody work, frankly, and I'm just going to start messing with the Irish instead. I do kind of want to marry her, though. She's got amazing uh, intrigue, which isn't really what you want in a wife. Sometimes that's really bad, because amazing intrigue means that they're very amazing at, at killing you. Possibly Maria. Who's the eldest? Adel, Haid or Maria? Arpad is the eldest, she's 
Huh. Hmm. Where did all that go, by the way? I've lost it. Well, maybe we'll marry Adelaide just to get something done here. I mean, I'm not going to play perfectly. I'm not looking to min max everything at this point. I'll search. Why do you hate me so much? Here we go. Uh, she's a bit of a trouble baker. I mean, she's cynical, greedy, cruel, and envious. Nice mix. And I don't know. Maybe she's got. Uh, can I? All right. Can I find a good stewardship? Yeah, look at Rocca. So Rocca has a claim to Apulia, which, if my memory is correct, is part of Italy. Off day, Italy. Duchy of uh, Apulia. Oh, blimey, that's actually quite a lot of it. Uh, it's only the duchy, but not too shabby. So she's no, she's no kind of country bumpkin. This is a, a fairly prestigious woman. The who you choose to marry is we're all about to see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Um, Try and oh, I've lost her now. Where is she? Uh, stewardship girl. That's right. You. She's only a courtier, but so that might be a problem. But she has a claim, so she's she's not a bad one. So uh, because she's the relative of the duke, there's no prestige bonus or malice for marrying her. If you marry someone who's beneath your station, you're going to lose prestige. If you marry someone who's above your station, you're going to gain it. But she's pretty good. She's not as touched. And that can also pay off later in other ways, I think. And I was also mentioning the matrilineal button. So let's say you're playing as a female character. Obviously, the line of well, I say obviously, the line of succession is determined by the kind of who has the upper hand in the marriage. So if you're a woman and you just marry a bloke, stand fella, the kids will be of his dynasty, unless you go for matrilineal marriage, in which case they'll be of your dynasty. And if you start looking for matrilineal marriages, you're going to find that the p potential list of suitors drops off tremendously. But we do not want that. Um, we get a non-aggression pact with two people out of this, and I do actually gain some prestige. So yeah, let's marry her. That's done. All right, so marriage. There you go. Let's move on to unmarried heir. Ah, now, Brian, you also need to get married. You'll probably have a slightly different set of options available to you. And again, I'm going to want to marry you off to somebody. I kind of want to get you betrothed to the Princess of France, to be frank. Because if you <laughs> to be frank, do you get it? Um, it doesn't really work, does it? The Franks are actually the Germans. I can't even do um, Dark Age banter properly. So... Betrothing you to her might be pretty good. Where is she in the old line of succession? So if you hover over here, you can see the line of succession. Princess Emma doesn't feature heavily in it. She's female. But the, the real benefit here is that your kids will have a claim. And you never know, my grandson having a claim on the Kingdom of France could be pretty handy. So we might well do that. Let's get you betrothed to her. You'll also get a slight prestige bonus. That's that one dealt with. Now... Picking an ambition. This button here on the uh, character page determines your ambition. And there are various options available to me, and I should have done this earlier. I'm gonna first of all I'm gonna get married because it's just a quick tend in piety because I'm about to get married. We'll talk about the other ones when they come up, so we'll just get that one done. Uh, I can press de jour ducal claim. So I mentioned this earlier, Desmond is part of de jour, part of the petty kingdom of of Mumu, even though right now it's not a part of the petty kingdom of Mumu. It uh, is just an independent county, but it should be, and that means that I can attack this guy and get it. So that's there, and we'll think about that. And then we've got the minor titles, and there are minor titles available. We're so nearly there, just bear with me. Um, I have four commander slots, and they're all reasonably good. I just want to have a look to see if there's anyone better available. I might go chasing in the fine character screen for that. This kind of vanilla minor titles page you is fairly basic. And you have one, two, three, four titles that I sometimes there's more depending on rank and what have you, but these kind of there's a bunch of basic titles which are kind of not proper titles, they're honorary titles, uh, is the uh, the proper 
name for them. They are not handed down uh, hereditarily. They're just sort of, you know, little bonuses, little medals that you can hand out, titles uh, or more like jobs. And they come with a salary, which is very small, and they come with prestige. And most importantly, they boost the opinion of the person uh, who you give them to. So we're just going to rattle through these fairly quickly. I'm going to make Rangvald Master of the Horse. I'm going to make Flay 3 Master of the Hunt. I'm going to make High Almoner Dinner Touch. And that's my vassals all cheered up. And then for the Cupbearer, I mean, it doesn't really matter. And everybody hates me. So, you know, it's not a big deal. The Designated Region is a big deal. Um, I mean, there are events where... Let's say I take a knock on the head, I can develop the trait incapable, at which point um, my stats will all get drastically reduced. And although I'm still alive and nominally in charge, my region will take over all of the day to day running and will have the ability to veto uh, my decisions, and it's generally a pain in the ass. And the same happens if you're a kid, but my heir is 18, so that's not likely to happen. You want somebody, however, as a regent who is reasonably skilled particularly one who is skilled in stewardship, if at all possible. And yeah, I'm just going to put my 16-year-old steward in as my regent. So he already likes me, and he's going to like me a lot more now. Can look at commanders? Yeah, we'll quickly take a look at commanders. So this is really just a sort of demonstration of the ways in which you can use this fine character screen. Full stop. Huh? I want to search out commanders, so I want to to specify men who are not in prison, don't care if they're married, uh, don't care if they're rulers, diplo range, yeah, only people who I've managed to get on board, and people who are willing to join my cause. That is the most important thing. Look at this 32 year old genius. How is he a genius with such bad stats? Oh, he's not a genius, he's attractive, that's why. And then you sort by military skill. And one of the reasons I want to do this is because I wanted to quickly discuss military traits. And we have happily one guy here who actually has one. Adamar of Limoges is he's not just a brilliant strategist, but he's also a heavy infantry leader. So he gets a 20% bonus when leading heavy foot troops. You can get some incredibly important military traits. They always look like this, they're orange. Um, he's literally the only one out there. Uh, we are definitely going to ask him to join the court. You do that by right-clicking on his portrait and going invite to court and then hitting yes. Come and be a military commander for me. He's also got 20 marshal, which is also super useful. And actually, I mean, I, I could upgrade my other ones as well, but you're gonna, I'm going to piss off Flay 3 when I sack him, so I don't want to upset too many more people. Guess what, folks? We're ready to roll the time thing the clock that's another 47 minutes so i'm going to stop recording now and um in tomorrow's video because i've decided i'll release these daily like i'm some kind of actual proper let's player uh in tomorrow's video we're actually going to press the space bar and let time advance isn't that exciting thank you so much for watching and hopefully you've managed to survive so far i promise that things will start to happen now all righty stop recording